share a little bit of your heart and all of this going on, maybe even some of your story of how you've personally experienced some prejudice or injustice or you've seen happen. I know we've talked and you've even seen some of that in the church. Um, which we think yes. the church is just the safe, perfect place that nothing's ever <laughs> happened there, but it has. And um, just to share some of your story, and then I want to get into some practical things that um, what you uh, sh- what you want to share with us, the River Church, on your heart, or some things we can practically do as a church, um, yeah. and even speak to some of us white people out there of <laughs> how do we? We'll never understand what we will yes. never be able to comprehend. Yeah. But what can we do? How can we support? How can we love? How can we come along our brothers and sisters in the black community and really um, be the hands and feet of Jesus to everybody? Amen. So Amen. I know I threw a ton of stuff out, um, no, but I fine. just, I want you to just share. I mean, it, we've, we've had so many conversations this week and it's been absolutely amazing. Um, but please, I'll just, I'll just give you the floor. Well, thank you, Pastor. Um, just a little bit of my history. I was born pre-civil rights movement, obviously. My little gray hair gives that away. But um, so I experienced pre-civil rights life in America, you know, as have many, many, many millions of people. So I, I don't want to, and I don't want to present myself as the, you know, this the complete voice for the whole thing because everybody's experience is uniquely intertwined here. And so um I want to put that out there, but as a young person, I grew up in the um, Air Force, in the military, and there are a couple of stories, um, short stories, that kind of um, show what people have experienced, and when I was young, we moved to Japan, and my father, um, we he was going to get housing, um, to get his housing assignment for the military base, so we were sitting on the side, we were in civilian clothes, and um they called my father's name and a young airman stood up and just started screaming at my father calling him every name in the book and just reading him up and down and everything which you know and he went on for what seemed like an eternity however i'm sitting there mortified that first my father's not doing anything he's you know i would have punched him you know you want to your first reaction is to fight you know and so but he just stood there and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, so of course you're, you're mortified and you're embarrassed and you go through all of that. But when the man began to cool down, the only thing my father did was pulled his wallet out of his back pocket, opened it up and laid it on the table. And the airmen saw that my father outranked him by at least six or seven stripes. And all the color left this man's face. My father fought a war without saying a, war, a word. And he taught us to fight in the same way. You don't have to because had he fought that with his fist or even with his words, he would have lost every stripe he had earned and he would have lost the opportunity to move forward. So that was a big, big um, example of how to combat prejudice for me. That was that was huge. And um, in a similar story in my adult life, you know, as um, I went to a church and um, I joined this church thinking just because, you know, it's a church in our in our denomination, I'm just going to go there. And when I walked through the doors, um, my pastor came to me after the service and said people had come up to him and said, those people need to worship with their own kind. They don't need to be here. We were the first family to integrate this particular fellowship. So that that was hard, you know, and then on top of that, two times the n-word was used from the pulpit not by my pastor but people who were standing in the pulpit um used it one person said it in um in habit he grew up in and that's the language of his culture it wasn't you know that he didn't mean it mean spiritedly that's just how people talked you know if you remember paula dean that's just how people talk you know so um, he did come back once he realized and he apologized and I knew he was sincere about that, but another person used it intentionally. And so when, and those are two different places and my father always taught me to pay attention. You know, everybody is not coming from the same motive place. You know, you need to, you need to recognize that. 
And so um, having stayed there, you know, in willing to stay where God placed me, because my first reaction, people are like, why are you still there? You know, kind of deal. But my, which was my reaction, but the Lord challenges us to stay and to break down barriers. That's our, that's our job as Christians, as ambassadors for Christ. We are sent here to do exactly that. So he he caused me, you know, to stay. And in that, people who had never had a relationship or an experience with African American people got a firsthand, up close, personal experience with me, which changed the way they thought. You know, they were not locked into the commentary that they saw in the news or on in movies or so forth. They got to actually see someone and ask the hard questions. You know, I, I try to give permission, people permission to talk to me. You don't, you know, even if what you're asking me is crazy, you know. So I had another experience. I had two more. I'm sorry, but um, no, another thing in church, because I'm trying to, to paint the picture for the church. You know, it, uh, society is one thing, but the church is something completely different. And so in the church, I had a teacher in um, teaching a Sunday school class, and she came across the river. Niger, but she chose to pronounce it in the other term. And so it was shocking. And I'm like, wow, you know, did she really go there? But um, staying there and confronting, because that was a deliberate thing as well, but staying there and confronting it, she had to confront her own prejudice. She had to confront that within herself. And I watched the Holy Spirit transform her thinking so that later on we are to this day very good friends you know and so then the third the fourth example is a lady in the church who was giving me a ride home one day and she said but joyce wasn't slavery a good thing because you know you people got to learn about jesus and I mean, she literally said that i was like oh okay <laughs> and so um you know, understanding that she came from a truly sincere place. She was not trying to be offensive. In her mind, she had found a way to justify slavery by bringing in the gospel and saying, you know, it's it's kind of like a pimp telling a child prostitute, aren't you glad, but I feed you. And, you know, I've given you a family, you know, you're in my stable and I'm misusing your body, but you know, you're, you're right here. So, and I'm taking care of you. It's, it's that, it was that kind of mentality. So we had a conversation and again, conversations are huge. Um, being really willing to not be offended, but to, to allow people to ask questions as crazy as that question sounds, you know, and it might not sound crazy to some people, but <laughs> as crazy as that question sounds, um, um, be willing to, to extend grace instead of anger. You know, yes, I was, I, you know, I could have slammed my fist down, you know, and all of that, but that served no purpose. And so, um, those are just a few of the examples. I could sit here all day and talk about stuff we've encountered, you know, but um, I do want to give one more picture. It's a quick picture just to just to help um, understand what it feels like as as African Americans in our nation. If you can imagine the game of Russian roulette, you have a, a gun that has five empty chambers and then that one bullet. And you spin that, you know, cylinder and the, and then you point it at someone's head and you click. And maybe a thousand times that click doesn't bear any kind of problem. But that one time, you know, there's always the fear and the threat that this time is going to be it. So when young men and, and women alike see that red light, they're seeing the gun at their head. When, when people, you know, having counters they do simple things like going jogging oh that's the that's the gun you know or they're doing something as mundane as watching birds you know boom that's the that's the the gun at your head and so having living with that kind of anxiety you know always being watchful having to pay attention to who i am and my son is the same exact size as george floyd and he's the same height, he's the same body build. And 
And he tells me all the time, mom, I have to be conscious of what I look like to people when I'm in space. You know, when I go shopping, when I walk in a store, I have to be conscious of who I am and how people are going to react. And so you're, you're constantly watching this see, you know, are you afraid of me? You know, and, and I'm sure that that's not normal, you know, but on the reverse side, I was, I was driving through and my car broke down in a little community up in the hills somewhere. And when I, when I got out of my car, all I saw was, uh, was um, Confederate flags on the back of trucks. And I'm like, oh my Lord, I'm gonna die in these mountains. And so when I went in, I was terrified. And uh, the waitress in this little restaurant saw my face and she said, baby, it's okay, you're, oh, you're safe here. And she told the men of those trucks, go fix her car and I'm gonna feed you. And that, that was my experience. So what I saw was terror of these flags, but what I got was grace. And so that, that's what God calls us to do, you know, to, to, to take that extra measure, to, to, to take that extra step. Don't, don't just jump to conclusions, you know, so that's just my little experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is absolutely, I can't even imagine. I, I can't even imagine. Um, thank you for sharing. I know some of that isn't, easiest to share stories or, or things yeah. you've experienced and, and to hear your heart of just the grace. Thank you. That's absolutely, absolutely amazing. I can't eat. Yeah. Um, we, we wanted to talk um, today and have this conversation and um, even share Sue some things you, you had mentioned um, before we started recording, you had some scripture um, yes. you wanted to share and, and really want that to be the focus of our conversation to 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 go to god's word to to search the scriptures what is what does god have to say about this what is what is he taught us what does jesus have to say about this um and really letting that shape the narrative of our conversation not what we've seen on the news not yeah. this over here not that over yes. there um but what is god saying how does god view all this how how do we as a church yeah. move forward um, to bring about the community, the relationships that God desires Amen. Um, for each and every one of us to have. So I'd love for you to, to share that scripture um, okay. and, and to walk us through that this morning. Okay. Amen. Um, over the past season, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a struggle, you know, um, I was challenged and, and just for, you know, my own, um, testimony you know i have two sons i have two grandsons i have brothers and uncles and and males in my family so when these things and i don't want to become emotional and i was i've been doing good so far this morning but um when these things begin to happen and um like you said people kind of see it and just keep moving um it's very hard it's very hard not to be an African-American before I am a Christian, if that makes sense to you. You know, um, my identity is not African-American. My identity is in Christ. But it's hard when these things happen because it, it almost elevates the, that your, your personal experience above scripture, you know, I know what the word says, but at the time I'm hurting so bad, I can't, I forget, you know, the, the scripture gets lowered and the experience gets higher, you know, in, in, um, um, you know, I think it's second Corinthians 10, you know, where it talks about our, our weapon, you know, our, about how, um, we have divine weapons. Thank you, Jesus. We have divine weapons to tear down strongholds, you know, things that exalt themselves up above the knowledge of God. And so for me, my African-American experience was exalting itself up against the knowledge of God. What I knew was true from God, that became my primary focus. And I, I knew that that was wrong. I knew that that was a carnal response to a spiritual problem. And I, I knew that, however, I, 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 it, was, it was hard. 
And so I began to search the scriptures and the Lord brought a particular passage to my heart. And it's, it's so funny. I think you said that was what was on your heart too. So it, yeah, it, the exact same scripture has been on Absolutely. my heart all week. And so when we yeah. mentioned it, it was like, okay, the Holy Spirit's moving. We need to focus <laughs> in on the scripture. God's got something for all of us this morning. Exactly. And you know, he, that's the joy of the Holy Spirit. He, he unites the body, you know, so that, that is my joy. But, um, so the scripture for me was um, found in Luke 10, 25 through um, 37, the story of the Good Samaritan. But prior to that, you know, before we lock into the Good Samaritan, what, what, what led to Jesus creating that image for us was the fact that he was being challenged and the lawyer, you know, stood up and he, you know, he wanted to get in Jesus's face and, you know, he asked about becoming, how do you get to, you know, have eternal life? And, and so he proclaims, you know, this lawyer says, um, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, go. And if you do those things, you will gain eternal life. And so in his smugness, he says, to Jesus, um, so who is my neighbor, you know, kind of attitude. And um, Jesus, you know, I love how he responds to us in his word. And so he brought this to us the story of the Good Samaritan. And so um, I've typically read that story from the perspective of the two Levites, I mean, the two Jewish leaders and the Samaritan, but Jesus pointed out there are six players in this story. And so I'm going to list those. And and I don't want to, you know, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out, but but just to kind of go through the the six characters. So you have the victim who is the man laying in the street bleeding. Um, he has been robbed. So you have the robbers. You have the the man laying in the street bleeding, almost dead. And then you have the priest who is a very um, he is a representative of the law to the people. Literally, he's a representative of the law. And then you have the Levite, who rep who also represents the law, but he is all he takes care of the the temple. He's a he's assigned to take care of the temple. So you have these two religious leaders who are very well versed in the law, and then you have the Samaritan who comes across and um, he stumbles across this man. So the first two see him and they decide not to do anything but keep going. The, the Samaritan sees him and it's, in, it's interesting to note that what Jesus says and what he doesn't say are equally important um, here in this story. So he identified the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan man. And he also said the Samaritan man was on a journey. It, it, he changed the way that he described him. He wasn't just on the road, he was on a journey. So we know that he had a place to be. He was going somewhere that was probably very important to him. But instead of going there, he stopped in his tracks and he saw this man, he rendered help, he put him on his beast, he took him to the end, he, we meet the sixth, you know, the the sixth player in the story. He he introduces, you know, he takes care of his needs, and then he gives money to the innkeeper and says, you know, if he, you need anything else, here's my business card. Hey, you know, I will take care of him. You know, just just let me know what he needs. So you have all these players in that story. You have the robbers, the victim, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, and the innkeeper. You have all six of these players. So when the Lord challenged me to take that, that image of those six players, now superimpose the video from George Floyd mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm. So the robber who was literally robbing Mr. Floyd of his life has his knee on his neck. That's the robber. That's the criminal in the, in the incident. But then you have, and you have Mr. Floyd as the victim. He is the man laying in, literally laying in the middle of the street, literally laying there bleeding. And his life is, 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 is just leaving his body right before our eyes. And then you have the law enforcement person of Mr. Towel, who's literally standing there with his back most of the video with his back to the situation. He's literally walking around 
and ignoring the problem. And then you have two other police officers who are law enforcement. They are, they are, they are the people responsible for keeping the law are on him in the back assisting the uh, Mr. Chauvin in, in this man's death. Then you have the Good Samaritans, who are all those spectators that we don't see on camera, but we hear them trying to render aid. They're trying to say, hey, you know, he's dying, he's bleeding, can't you see? He's not breathing, he's not breathing, can you see? Long after he had gone unconscious, he, he, um, they're still trying to get this man to let him up. So, and you know, I don't wanna go into all the details of that, but just that picture of the Good Samaritans. But then you have the witness. The final witness is the camera, the video. The video is, is the innkeeper. The video is the one that gets to go and, and, and render assistance long after, after he's been helped, if that, does, if that makes any sense. And I'm not trying to make a stretch here, but, but with the video, the video is what's going to go to the court systems. The video is what's going to go and render him help after long after everybody else is gone you know after all the players have been put in place he that video is the good samaritan witness you know so so what does that have to do with me and 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 you know how do i react to that when i look at that imagery i have to ask myself am i a levite or am I a priest that I have the law? It's, you know, it's, it's been, you know, it's embedded in my heart. You know, the Lord tells me it's in my heart. You know, I can't get away from the concept of justice. I know what justice looks like. I know what right and wrong. I know when someone is hurting because I have the Holy Spirit and he's telling me constantly that is pain. And so because of that, I, I'm without excuse, just like the priest and the Levite were without excuse in this in in this narrative because of um, their ability to render help and their decision not to. You know, we do that all the time, and and so and you mentioned that in the beginning when you were talking about how we see it and we say, oh, how sad that is, and then we just go shopping or do whatever. We we continue on with our lives. And what this, this, this um, story that Jesus tells us is our responsibility is to be the Good Samaritan. We are the person that gets to speak and gets to help and gets to render assistance to people that are in our community hurting. So what, is that, what does that look like? You know, how do we get there? How do we become Good Samaritans? How do we do that? And, and the first thing that rose up in my heart is first, I have to acknowledge what I'm looking at. You know, I see the man is dying. You know, I see that right in front of me. And so when we, when we look at the protest and all of the rioting and all of that stuff that's going on, we have to be able to discern. We have the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to, to discern whether these people out here are looking to do harm or these people out here are trying to make a statement. Don't let the statement of what that is, similar to how the priest and the Levite, um, one of the things many people talk about with them is the fact that if they, um, if they had touched him, they would have become ceremonially unclean and not able to do their duty, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. However, um, so when we are making those kinds of judgments, we are we are exalting things above people and and the need, you know. So we have to be careful not to be biased in our or selfish in our when we look at these things, we can't say, oh, this is this is none of my business, you know, that's that's on him, you know, you gotta take care of yourself. Or when we see pro protesters out there, we can't be silent. And I appreciate you, Pastor, saying that Mr. Floyd's video represents the entire system that has been operating for years. He is not the first. Even I've heard people say that, oh, there's only like 20 or 30 people. Well, those are 20 or 30 people that have been caught on camera. 
that means that that's the tip of the iceberg and there's thousands more that are never captured on camera. And it's not just as one of my dear sisters on Facebook said, she had the same thing happen to her son and he's white. You know, it, it's not just a black or white thing. And, and which is another point, I know I'm all over the place here and I apologize, <laughs> but um, this is not about race. It's yeah. not a race thing, even though it is. It involves race, but it's not about race. And we have to be careful to understand that because the word tells us that my battle is not against flesh and blood, but my battle is against powers and principalities. So we need to call it by its right name. We can't, once we get pigeonholed into race, like my experience as an African-American woman, as I allow the enemy to pigeonhole me into that position, whether it's political or racial or gender or, you know, Oh, whatever, whatever that little thing he wants me to pigeonhole and hyper focus on, I'm missing God's purpose. And so I can't do that. And we have to be careful not to allow this to become political or not to be, you know, um, people are saying, oh, well, if you if you responded to George Floyd or to the target burning before you talked about George Floyd, then shame on you. Well, you know, uh, we can't, that does not serve a purpose to throw memes at each other on Facebook. You know, you find the meme that supports your ideology and then you sling it out there and somebody else finds a bunch of memes to support their argument and they sling it. And so we're battling with carnal weapons. That's what that looks like to me. That's a carnal weapon. When I'm sitting here battling my opinion over yours, who cares what we think? It's what does God say? You know, my opinion's no more valuable or no less valuable than anybody else's, but God's opinion is what stands for all of us. And so when we, when we participate in that fruitless battle on Facebook, and I've done it, so I'm not trying to say, you know, act like I haven't been there. I took my pot shots too, you know. And in fact, I was trying to draft a letter to another organization just to kind of bring light to what's going on. And, and the letter kept being filled with my opinion. And I was like, well, this isn't working because it's, it's, it keeps being one-sided, you know. And so I had to just shut that down because it's not about me. It's not about you. So Another scripture I want to leave us with, and I know I'm, I'm all over the place, but we as Christians have been given two, two edicts from the very beginning. You know, from the beginning, God told us to go forth and multiply. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. So that's the, that's the same verse. And then uh, it tells us to subdue the land, you know. So we are to, we are as the christians we are out there to be peacemakers literally we have our feet shod with the with um with with um peace so you know so as we go we need to be peacemakers we need to go out there um we need to have a listening ear we need to um overcome our christian sensibilities i know that um for some of us uh, you know, we have to get over it, the language that they're using. That's not relevant right now, even though it is, you know, I mean, I, we're not supposed to use bad language and all of that. But if that's how someone in their pain talks to me, you know, it's kind of like a woman in, la in labor. She might say a little bit of anything when she's in labor, you know. <laughs> Be, oh honey it's so you know she may not be nice you know <laughs> trying to get this baby out you know so it's, it's i've never experienced that myself i know i know and i've never <laughs> said anything you know but <laughs> but the truth is it may come out raw it may come out unfiltered it may come out in in anger it may come out accusing it may come out that way but god's given us armor to handle that we can handle it you know, he's given us the Holy Spirit to to protect us against that. So so we are to press in anyway, you know, kind of like when Paul, you know, he's preaching the gospel. They took him out and stoned him. He jumped right back up and went back in there. I'm going to keep preaching until, you know, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So as we know that we have eternal life already, you know, then here's the second of the two. We're to go and make disciples and all of that. And we are to share love and we're to be ministers of reconciliation, reconciling people unto God and, and, and men to one another. That is our role. But the secondary role is we are to be ambassadors. 
and as ambassadors, because this kingdom is not our kingdom. We belong to the kingdom of God. We are on, we are on mission sent from God, every single Christian yeah. as an ambassador to come. And so we get to be ambassadors once all the smoke has, has settled and all the, you know, everybody's gone home, there's going to be a broken and hurting community on both sides. People have lost things. People have, have done things. People have said things. All of that is going to be raw, you know? And um, so we have the opportunity and the privilege to represent God to this community. Mm -hmm. You know, the people we may want to avoid, we may need to go and talk to them, the people who, you know, we may not like, you know, we need to go, you know, when I think about um, Jesus, and um, the word tells us that sin is a sin is a stench into his nostrils. So if you can imagine a holy, sinless God coming down amongst us that, you know, I heard a gentleman, I know this is kind of gross, but I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, this is how my brain works, but um, I heard a gentleman on Focus on the Family years ago, he had been a mafia hitman, and he was just really wretched, you know, with sin. And he said, when he found out about the grace of God, his imagery was as if God had reached down, pulled his righteous, holy, precious sleeves up, reached down into a cesspool, and pulled him up and brought him to his breast and loved on him. And that's what broke his heart. And I think we get to extend that same kind of grace to communities that are broken. You know, what we're looking at is broken people. What we're looking at is hurt people. What we're looking at is, you know, the, the results of of a system that has been trying to put band-aids all over this thing and God is saying pull the band-aids off. I, I I will share this and and I know I'm talking a lot, but um if you realize that Mr. Floyd's video happened on the very day, Memorial Day, the day that we are celebrating people who have given their lives to ensure that we maintain freedom in this nation and his freedom was taken away. It was almost as if God said, let me show you what the story of the Good Samaritan actually looks like, you know, and you can, you can remove Mr. Floyd and put anybody in there. It doesn't matter, you know, anybody, maybe it's a coworker that is, you know, being abused and going through a bunch of stuff and just crying out to, you know, they can't get to work on time because they don't have a ride, that kind of thing. I've been there, done that, you know, maybe it's, it's someone who's ready to be evicted, or maybe it's someone who just lost their job from, you know, the whole pandemic. Maybe it's someone who's lost many family members. If we realize that the reason all of this um, protesting and rioting and everything else has been going on. If you take an entire world, especially our nation, and you lock them in their house for months without human contact, without, without supplies, without all of the stuff, you know, just, just even regular people are going crazy, you know, and so they've been locked in for months. And they, most people have been on social media. So they've been watching video after video after video, feeding that, that animal inside, feeding that, that, that attitude, feeding all of that all this time. And then on top of all of that, you drop Mr. Floyd's video, people exploded. And, and that's not something, I know it sounds like it's making excuses, but it's not making an excuse. It's explaining the situation, what happens, you know, if you lock anybody up for that long and, and, and in the midst of such a fearful and, um, you know, difficult time, your, your emotions are raw and your emotions are, you know, not at their best. And so people act out. And so um, there's that. But those are, those are the, um, so how can we help, you know, what, what can I do as a Christian? And and um, what I can do, you know, first of all, is, you know, not be biased in my opinion, you know, be willing to hear the 
other side, just like I had to do with, you know, the churches that I experienced. I could have left, you know, and went back to the black church, you know, all black church, and I'd have been a happy camper, you know, Um, you know, but, but God challenged me to be a, you know, to be a change maker, you know, you, Mm. you, to break down walls, to, you know, you be the person, you grew up your whole life in this system, so you know what it feels like on both sides, and so you get to be able to go into a church environment who, of people who may not, you know, they may not like you, they they don't like your music, you know, they don't like anything about you, but that's okay. You know, I can still stay there long enough for the Holy Spirit to give, um, to, to, to give healing to those broken places in them and in me, you know, and so, um, stay, you know, um, I'm, well, I'm gonna throw this out here and you can edit it. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, you know, the Lord challenged me many, many years ago that it is the Holy Spirit's job to place you in the body. So I don't get to choose where I go to church. That's not my decision. It wasn't my decision. The family I grew up in, it's not my decision, my church family. That's not my choice. And so if I, it's not a club or an an organization that I'm joining, I am being placed in a family. And so that's important to me. That is so important. So when, when I hear people say, well, if you don't like something, go somewhere else. That's not scriptural. I'm sorry. You know, Jesus, I know I, I'm, I'm, Come on, come on. I I apologize, but but that's not scriptural. There is no place in the Bible you can show me where God started with the people and kicked them to the curb when they didn't act right. Israel is a prime example. If that were true, he would have got rid of Adam and Eve, you know, and made two more people. Or he would have made a whole nother nation instead of Israel. Y'all going to act stupid? Not a problem. I'll get rid of you and start again. And on and on and on and on and on, even the churches. So we have to get the mindset that instead of it being about me, which is what Satan told Eve, you know, it's all about you, girl. You know, God's denying you stuff, so you need to make this happen yourself that is a lie. That's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. So our yeah. responsibility is to stay place in place until God says move, you know, when mm-hmm. God says move, you got to move. But if he doesn't say move, then it's not my choice to make that decision. Why do I say that? Because he has placed people in our lives that are hard to love. But, but, but the interesting thing to me is that as a believer, he tells me to be salt and light. And he tells me, don't put a bushel over my light because, you know, then, you know, it's, it, it doesn't do any good. So if we are always around light, if we're only around other lights, that, I mean, it's cool. Yay. Happy birthday, you know, but, <laughs> but, but light does not need light. Darkness needs light. And so when, when we are living our lives, we need to look around for darkness. That's our job, to go find darkness and bring light to it. If we're not Amen. doing that, if we're not doing that, then that's a problem, you know? And, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, because I ain't acting like I'm doing all this all the time. So please don't get that mistake. This is just what's coming out, you know? So, um, you know, light, light does not need light. Light needs darkness so that it has its most powerful effect in light, in darkness. Jesus, I believe in on my whole heart. That's why he sat with sinners and publicans. He told us he doesn't need the people that are already well. They don't need him. The ones that need him are the people that are broken. So what does that look like in our today? Not only from the protests, but from the pandemic. We can't, you know, we, we, we are very... Um, and my son tells me, don't use words you don't know what they mean. And I think the word is myopic. <laughs> He's always telling me that. But I think it's my, when you're, you have one view, you only have one sight. You know, you're, you, you only see things through one lens. We can only look at one thing at a time. So, so first it was all about the pandemic. And then, okay, now it's all about the protests. We forgot there was a pandemic. The pandemic is still there. You know, it's still going on. We're still sheltered in. So there are people wounded from that. There are people wounded from the protests. There are w- people wounded from losing their jobs. There are people wounded all around us. So we have a tremendous 
opportunity. It's like when the word tells us the, the fields are white, the harvest, it's ready. You know, God has, he makes all things work together for good. So the good of all of this, not for my personal good, even though I personally profit from his good, it's not all about me. You know, it's about him, his kingdom and his glory. So, so in that, the, the exciting part is that he gets to use me and he uses circumstances circumstances like oppression you know to to bring things to the surface to to expose things so that they can be fixed you know you can't fix what you don't acknowledge and so um here's the other thing i know this is i'm saying a lot but um on um so on may 5th may 5th well, the first week of May was a week that was dedicated to fasting and praying for our nation to end on the seventh day, which was the National Day of Prayer. So interestingly enough, as we're praying on the fifth day, um, there was a, a call to for God to hear um, the cries of his people. And on that very day, on the fifth day, the video from the, the McMichaels, he was moved, Gregory McMichaels was moved to drop the video on uh, to give it to the um, news people and it and it hit facebook so that it it exposed the problem and on the day that of the national day of prayer mr mcmichaels was arrested the day of memorial day two videos dropped i don't know if people are familiar with miss amy cooper you know and her whole mm -hmm. thing about oh you know a black man is trying to assault me the fake thing that she did because he asked her to put a leash on her dog. That happened on the same day as George Floyd, <clears throat> excuse me, but these three videos represent the biggest picture. They couldn't have told our story even, even better. You have two men that feel they have the right to run down a man and shoot him and point a gun at him, whether you wanna call it defense or not. They pointed a gun at this man and he tried, you know, whether he was, a, he, you know, whatever, he, he went after the gun and he ended up dead because these men felt they had the right to run him down. Miss Cooper, and this is gonna sound harsh and, and I, I kind of apologize, but I kind of don't because I want to use terminology that, is, that is, is being used today. She, she pulled the race card, the white race card, and she weaponized her whiteness. And this, this is, this is it's a harsh term but if you listen to her story and watch the video she knew in her mind that all she had to do was accuse this white this black man of assaulting her or threatening her and she knew that the police would come to her defense and he would be in trouble that's a scary thought when people can use that as a weapon if you if you look at the bigger picture of that it's you know she lost her job she lost her dog they came and got her dog you know and and all of that but at the same time, if we if we pay attention to the small details like that, that when we look at things through God's eyes and say, wait, she just used a weapon without pointing a gun. She knew that she had the power within American society that her story would be more important than than his story. And you know that that is frightening. So when we see that kind of behavior, we have to call it for what it is. And and then Mr. Floyd, of course, we've already talked about how that's a perfect picture of the Good Samaritan story. So we, ha you know, there's a lot to think about. And and this is all kind of mm -hmm. stuff that's been culminating in my brain. And and you know, I'm sheltered in, so I got a lot of time to think. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> so but, um, I just love my church, and I love my family, and I and I love you know I. I love people, you know, it, it's, it's, um, what a privilege. Cause I know my history, I know where I came from and, and, and it wasn't pretty, you know, I was not the pretty raised in church kind of girl, you know, I was the one you probably would avoid and go around and cross the street from, you know, kind of person. I was pretty raw, pretty hurt. And my hurt manifested in a lot of different ways. And so without going into a whole bunch of detail, um, understanding the grace that was given to me and God used Christians to shine light in my darkness in my lowest moment he moved me next door to a woman who who glowed in the dark she was so much light I mean she literally glowed in the dark and I'd never met anyone like her and her love 
is what, and her constant love of this, this man named Jesus. I didn't even know who he was. This man named Jesus. She kept talking about him like he lived in her back bedroom. You, you know, it was crazy. And so her, her light, her prayers, I'm sure, transformed my heart and took me from an atheist to a believer. You know, that like that. I mean, just because God put me next door and and I would probably, my household probably would have been the household you would be praying off your block. You know, get those people off my block. You know, we want a peaceful neighborhood. Well, don't pray them off. Pray them into the kingdom. Don't pray them off your block. Don't pray them off your job. Pray them into the kingdom. Don't pray people off. You know, pray them in. And so that's a challenge for us. Pray them in. You know, if you can't say it to their face, say it. You know, she she tried. And, you know, I probably had a whole bunch of words to say for her because I was pretty raw. And it came out unfiltered, you know. But she kept loving on me anyway. And she loved me into the kingdom. And then he gave me another woman who sat me down and fed me these vegetable cookies that were horrible, but she also fed me the word of God and Amen. she taught me God's word. So, you know, we have, we have privilege and opportunity. So amen. 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 I'm done. I know. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's fantastic. And, and um, I personally, I've been through a journey um, this week and, and Joyce, you've played a huge part in that in my heart and being able to share even, um, uh, Thursday, I was on a call with other pastors um, mm. who may not live in an area as natomous, as diverse and um, mixed together that I absolutely love because I think it's a picture of heaven. I truly think it is. And talking with and, and being able to help some other pastors being able to process through some of the stuff. And I just keep coming back to two things. One, to listen more right. than we ever have ever, yeah. ever before right now. I don't yeah. think we've ever learned to really listen. And I think we can listen yeah. better. Yeah. Um, and to, to, to sit alongside of those. And I see in grief yeah. and, and people that are hurting yeah. and, and it's something as, as strange as it may seem in, in college, when you become a pastor, you talk about grief and stages of grief and how to care for those who are in your church or in your community yeah. as they walk through grief. And one of those, the, the most prominent one is just the the ministry of presence and yeah. it, and all it is yeah. is sitting there and keeping your mouth shut yes and yes. just listening you're not trying to tell them this is what you have to do next or right. right they're in a better place or this is what god wanted for them or anything like that that is so the wrong thing to say yeah. but a ministry of presence is to sit and to just yeah. listen and I think that's what we need to do right now for our community. I know there's, there's incredible, incredible people in our church. You've shared that with yes. me with the ladies Bible study that just oh, yes. listened to you. Yeah. Yes. And it, it, oh, it brought me to tears of joy to mm. know that our family is caring for each other. And we have incredible people in our church who look at others and see them the eyes of Jesus through the eyes yeah. of Jesus and yeah. care for them. And the other thing that I'm being reminded is our calling in life yeah. that each and every one of us has our call and reminded as yeah. me as a pastor yeah. to have conversations like this, to record them, to put them into our yeah. sermons, to, to share what scripture has to say, what Jesus yeah. has to say. And each and every one of us has that calling. And if you're a police officer, your calling right now is to be a police officer in the name of Jesus, yeah. to be that yeah. example. And we're yeah. not, we're not saying that every police officer out there is horrible. They're all the worst. Right. They need to go away. And I know some incredible police officers who, when they pull somebody over, they care for that person as if they were their own son or daughter. I and have experienced that, that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yes. we have business owners in our church that employ yes. people and care for them as if they were their yes. own family. We have so many people and so many different professions in our church that yes. live this out every single day. And I want to encourage and remind them that God has called you to that position yes. to continue to walk and be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be that good Samaritan yes. for those. And right now it's the community of the African American community that is hurting right now yes. and we need to help them and yes. not saying any, uh, anybody else is yes. less important That's right, right Thank now. You. The yes. immediate need for our nation right now is to care for, to support, to stand along, to help, 
to do what we can to bring about awareness, to love on people, to, to stand up for those who don't really have the full voice that they should right now. Yes. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much, Joyce. I really appreciate you coming on and um, sharing your heart and being open. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to what God's going to use through this yeah. and um, the change that's going to be brought about in our community and in our city and our state and, and beyond of what God, God is going to do um, yeah. through the River Church. And it starts with each and every one of us. It starts with us. So, yeah. and you said that, I don't know how many times today. And I just, uh, that's just, and your heart's incredible, Joyce. I love it. Thank you so much. I would love to pray for you as we wrap things up today, if that would be all right. And if you want to jump in and pray as well, um, I think we both can be praying for our nation and, and everything going on and, and the powers that be all the way up to the top um, that know that the decisions that they have to make, even if they're hard and uncomfortable, it's because that's what needs to happen. So yeah. let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Um, I'll open up. If you want to jump in, I'll pause there. Um, if not, I'll just close out. But okay. Okay. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today. And I just yeah. want to thank you for your daughter, Joyce. God, in her heart and willingness to open up and to share and to have some hard, awkward, uncomfortable conversations, God. But that's, that's when you work. That's yeah. when the Holy Spirit begins to, to dig down deep inside of us and to change us into who you've called us to be. Yeah. God, thank you for her, uh, uh, her story, God, and, and the uh, miracle work that you did through so many different characters that played such key roles in her life yeah. to bring yeah. her into your family, to bring her to the awareness of what was going on, to bring her to a point of being able to experience unconditional love and grace and mercy and just that, that, that time of that being able to be poured over her. Thank you for, for her steadfast, unwavering spirit at times in these churches, the, mm. that, that the times that you've called her to be in certain places at certain times to say certain words or to not say certain words, but to truly live out the example that you had called for her for that moment. God, I pray you would continue to use Joyce's voice to continue through this video and conversations in our church, continue to share the love that is through your son, Jesus, yes. to have those grace and those conversations to, yes. to when, when somebody says something maybe out of line or something that's inappropriate for, for her, oh man the boldness of Jesus to just stand there and to know and to have the spirit discerning to still love them. God, thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. God, we give this conversation to you today. Father, thank you for your example and your word and your story and parable of the good Samaritan that each and every one of us can learn and to step into and, and even being reminded of the, the cost of the money that the Good Samaritan paid mm. for the, the rehabilitation of the one who had been robbed. Mm. God, sometimes it may cost us something. I don't know what it may, yes. but yeah. sometimes it costs us. Lord, help us to keep you at the forefront, no matter if it costs us something. Mm. God, to continue to live out the calling that you've placed on each and every one of our lives, Jesus. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes. And Father, I just thank you for, um, for you, first of all, Lord God. If it were not for you, I know where I would be. So I'm so grateful, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are not a respecter of persons, Lord God, that, that there is no difference in your children. We are all your babies babies and we say thank you lord god i thank you father that you've given us the privilege and the opportunity to be peacemakers to be bridge makers lord god to 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 go out into the world lord god and shine light where there is darkness and to render comfort lord god where people are wounded and broken and hurting and and lord god thank you for giving us armor so we don't we don't have to take it personally, Lord God. We can, we can take it, Lord God. And we say, thank you, Father God. It is so worth it for your kingdom, Lord God. And, 
And Father, I do pray for my city and my nation. Lord God, I pray for my president as he has the weight of all of this on his shoulders and he has to make decisions, Lord God. And Father, I pray that you would be with him as, as he as he administers government to us, Lord God, just to just be with him, give him your wisdom, Father God, and, and um, give him obedience, Lord God, to what you have to say. Give all of our leaders, our, our governors and our mayors and our police chiefs and our judges and, and, and bosses and, and whoever else that is in a position of authority, give them your wisdom, Lord God. And then, Father, give us as your children, as we're broken and hurting, Lord God, God, give us the, the willingness and the heart to yield and to be patient and to wait for your deliverance, Lord God. Sometimes, Lord God, as you did with Israel, it took 10 plagues before Pharaoh yielded, Lord God. Give us the patience to wait, Lord God. It took 40 years to get to the promised land. Give us the patience to wait, Lord God. Give us the assurance that we know that you are not blind to what's going on in our lives, Lord God, and you right at this moment are working on it. So we say thank you, Father. I pray a covering over, over our city and our nation, Lord God, and I ask that, Father, that as children go out and, and bring light to these darkness, Lord God, that they will feel loved, Lord God, and I love you and I praise you. I thank you for my pastor and his heart. I thank you for my church family, and I love you so much, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> thank you so much, Joyce. I... Your heart again, it just explodes, and and I love it. And I'm so thankful that you're a part of our family, and your willingness to come and to share and to speak the hard truth sometimes into our lives. But that's that's what a true family is about, and it's it's about helping each and every one of us grow closer to Jesus and become more like Him every single day. And sometimes that includes a hard, uncomfortable conversation. Um, but that's, that's, that's when God truly moves and, and grows us in, in depths and ways that we can never imagine. Um, one thing, if, if we could, if you're still okay, um, I'd love to talk about real quick, just a snippet. Um, I'd asked you the question before our call of what can we do practically? Um, what are some next steps? Because I, I, this is great and awesome conversation and to hear stories and I think opens our eyes to really everything that, that's going on right now. But what are some things that we practically, either as a church, individually, um, what can we do um, to, to truly not fall asleep to this again, but to truly bring about, um, bring about the change that's needed in, in, our, in our nation? Um. One of the things that I didn't mention earlier is to educate yourself. Hmm. Step out of your own education and educate yourself on some of the concerns that are going on in our nation. Um, sometimes we only read one piece of history. We need to see it all. We need to be willing to let, take a look. I've had several friends that weren't willing to look at the whole nine minute video. If you can do that, you know, it gives you different perspective. Um, so educate yourself, you know, not only, you know, legally, but, you know, um, you know, all the programs and things look out there and see what is being said. And then um, one of the other things that I think we did talk about is the vote, you know, get out and, and be conscious of who you're voting for, what type of, um, be aware of the, um, not just on the higher levels but on the local levels like prosecutors and judges and you know where um, we yeah. talked about the whole Brock Turner thing and how that judge did not um, give justice in that situation he he was partial in his judgment of this young man uh, he he was partial you know I think it's um, I forget the verse now um, where it talks about you know don't be unjust toward one or the other you know so he he did not 
mete out justice. And so the people rose up and they voted him out of office and replaced him with a judge who would do his job correctly. So, so we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to change law. You know, we can um, be part of that whole system. But um, on a closer note to our, you know, church, um, last year, um, Lauren um, presented for us the if movement and I, she invited me i got to be a part of that i was so excited but one of the commentators in that um series talked about um being she has an organization called be the bridge so okay. if you go to the if um website you know the if gathering website you'll be able to see how you can become a part of that if if our church wants to start a group you know because it it, it teaches people how to create conversations and all of that so so that is a very practical way that you know i know awesome. it's pretty, but that's another practical way and um i think just being willing i i personally would love to see churches as a collective, whenever we get to meet again, I would love to have people come and sit down and and talk about it, you know, um, have a conversation, you know, and and be willing to, you know, to hear and like you said, to listen, you know, that it, that is such a big thing. Um, there is another organization that um, I was um, able to see and be a part of is, I don't know if people are familiar with Miles McPherson. He used to be um, a football player and he's a pastor he's, now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the pastor Rock. in San Diego. Yeah. Yep, at the Rock. Yeah, in yep. San Diego. He's a pastor of The Rock, but he has a video series and he has a ministry called Race for Unity. And, and he literally equips churches and individuals on how to be that bridge so you've got and that's for you guys because that's a football guy (laughs) so you know so you've got the ladies you know we have the if um, be the bridge through the if movement and then there's uh, miles mcpherson and um, race for unity so those are organizations that you can align with Um, i was sharing with pastor i don't like to offer um, organizations that i don't know what their basic Faiths are, or if they are skewed in their, you know, in. But these are two Christian organizations that I know that you can you can align yourself with and be safe, and you know that kind of thing. So, amen. And awesome. Yeah, and oh, have those conversations with your kids. You know, it starts in the childhood. It starts in the nursery. You know, starting to teach children. Um, one of the things that you get to see now that even though during Dr. King, there were a lot of, it was a mixed race. It was predominantly black, but today you're seeing young people that are rising up, even children that I know who are of, of families that may not be as, you know, um, you know, that may not be as kind. These young people are calling their families and their friends out and saying, Hey, this is wrong. And so I love that. And so, and that comes from being raised up and and having you know the lord minister to their hearts so they can say something you know we we may not we we need to speak up when we see injustice so that's good yeah lauren and i have been having conversations of about being very intentional with that um i for for me growing up it wasn't something um didn't necessarily teach that um but my parents modeled it every exactly. single day that they lived and I watched them. And I, that's, that's huge too, for us to watch Absolutely. as parents, what we say, what we do, how we talk to people, our kids yeah. are watching us way more than we ever think they are. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we start living that out intentionally, we have those conversations. We, we talk, we've been talking with our girls and doing that, like you said, that will change. And I even, um, there was, there was a pastor out of Texas. I cannot remember. Uh, pa- uh, Dr. Tony Evans, I think he's. Oh, yeah. Dr. Evans. Yeah. 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 He had talked about four levels yeah. of <laughs> personally, family, church, and community. And it starts yeah. with us personally, and then it goes to our family, yeah. and then our church, and then our yeah. churches together change the community. And so yeah. starting with us and then into yeah. our family, I thought that was, that was very practical. I appreciate his words. If you haven't watched, go check yeah. him out. Um, very good video he put together. 
um, on some of this stuff as well. So yes, thank you, yes. Joyce. I appreciate you being here. Thank Thanks to our church family for hanging out for something a little bit different, um, but something very needed and necessary right now in our times and in our community and in our world. And so I'm yeah. um, so thankful, Joyce, for this. This is not the end of the conversation. This is, this is just a tidbit of what will be right now, um, but we will continue in this and we will li list and push out some of these resources and um, items of further action that we can share with our church family and to take those and to share those with everybody we love. And then that is, it'll just multiply itself out um, yeah. and uh, we can, we can bring about that change in our world to bring the kingdom of God um, here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, Joyce. You have a blessed rest of your day. I will. And, uh, thank you. We will we'll talk well. to you later. Okay. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. What an incredible conversation um, that you guys just listened to and were a part of. Thank you again so much to Joyce for, for sharing and taking the time to talk with us to share your story. Um, and I greatly appreciated her heart to continue to go back to Jesus, continue to go back to the gospel, because that is what unifies us as a body of believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, is the gospel is the center of everything that we do. And I know, or it might have been for some of you, a little awkward or a little uncomfortable of a conversation. Um, but I believe that really was the Holy Spirit speaking to each and every one of us. I know at times in the in this past week that God has worked on my heart um, to continue to further the gospel, to further God's kingdom, to continue to further and be the hands and feet of Jesus to everybody, everybody in our community. And then John three sixteen says that God so loved the world, the whole world that gave his son that whoever, there's no asterisks there, there was no, there was no stipulations there, but whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. And that's God's love for each and every one of us. And so when the Holy Spirit sometimes comes in and reveals some stuff in our hearts or convicts us to continue to live in the calling that he has for each and every one of us, we need to step into that. And that's when the Holy Spirit grows us and God is glorified. So Amy's going to come now and lead us in worship. Love and appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for being an incredible example, not only in your families and in our community, but in Natomas and in our world around us. I love you guys. Good morning, friends. Happy Sunday. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said that we're fighting a battle that has already been won. And it made me think when he said that, I was thinking that we fight a battle differently if we know that we've already won it. Or if we knew that we had won the battle, we would fight it differently, wouldn't we, than we would if we didn't know that we'd won it. And I'll let you guys chew on that one this week, um, how we fight our battles. And this is how we fight our battles. I, join, I ask you to join with me in singing this morning. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles There's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles And I believe you've overcome And I will lift my song of praise for all you've done This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This 
in John 16 this week and this these two verses that I want to share with you this morning really just felt like a word from my heart this week and I pray that it will also be a word that speaks to all of you um, John 16 21 through 22 a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come but when her baby is born she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world so with you now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. These are painful times, and they're not painful like I skinned my knee painful. These are painful like a woman giving birth, kind of painful. But God sees that, and he hears that, and he promises us that he's coming, he's victorious, and we will have joy that no one can take away. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over
going to repeat that bridge this morning as our prayer. Lord God, heal our hearts and make them clean. Open up our eyes to the things unseen. Show us how to love like you have loved us. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. And we lay down everything that we are for the cause of your kingdom all the days that we are on earth until you take us home to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.